We've been talking about Romans, and I didn't have a real good uh, title for it, so I call it Romans. And, uh, and so we're at Romans chapter 2. I want to uh, connect chapter 1, some of the things in chapter 1 to chapter 2. Paul is writing to the church at Rome. The church of Rome is a very, is, was very prolific in its growth, and we believe that people came from Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was poured out, and some of them were, they were Jews, and they were filled with the Spirit of God, and, um, and many of them came. Uh, some could have gone to Rome uh, when uh, uh, Saul was threatening and killing people and put, or having them killed or voting for them to be killed. We know that. Not that he personally did it, but was responsible for their deaths and, and making havoc of the church, destroying the church, damaging the church. Uh, and, and people just left Jerusalem. They were getting out of, out of town. Sometimes when people leave, we, we draw erroneous conclusions. We feel like, oh, they were scared. I don't, I don't, I'm not afraid of anything. Usually, if God didn't call you to that position, don't take it. You know, don't take it. Don't just grab leadership just because you have a voice. Don't do that it, because you're going to hurt somebody. We have rules on our missions trips uh, that, where, that how people must comport themselves because when you're just your own person, you know, I'm an individual, you know, and have that uh, attitude, you'll get people killed. And, and, and so uh, it was of God that the church would leave Jerusalem. It wasn't of God that they would be uh, made havoc of, that they would be, uh, as it were. But they left Jerusalem, the apostles stayed there, and they went all uh, around. And the church, many people found themselves at Rome. And so Paul is writing to the church at Rome. Uh, a lot of Jews and a lot of Gentiles are now saved. And they're coming to the kingdom, like running out of a house that's burning with fire. And uh, so Paul writes because he wanted to go there, and he wanted to go there, but he just got delayed. And sometimes uh, the, the polity of the church, you know, the, the, the membership of the church uh, will sometimes, again, draw conclusions that the leaders don't want something or the leaders after something, and those things aren't necessarily true. Sometimes they are true that they have some corrupt leaders here and there, but uh, it, it wasn't the case. And sometimes... Uh, because Paul wanted to get to Jerusalem, but he was hindered from getting there. I think Paul says the enemy was hindering him, trying to keep him out of Jerusalem because he knew the effectiveness of Paul. And so sometimes we pastors and leaders and whatever our titles are, we're trying to do something. It's not working. And, and the, the church sometimes membership will draw erroneous conclusions, almost like, well, they don't like me or they're jealous of me or it's all kinds of things. But so Paul was pressing through to get there, but he could not get there. So it doesn't mean that Paul was lacking in faith. I mean, come on, he raised somebody from the dead. He did, performed, God performed all these miracles through him. He was trying to get there, but at the right time. At the right time, he came through, and he is, he is now about to get to Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit has given him a full release. And so we have, we have read and taught you some of those things. I wanted to start now in verse 20, to, uh, to chapter 1, verse 20. So we're going to go back to chapter 1, verse 20, and we're going to read some things because we want to tie them in to uh, chapter 2. I believe that the Holy Spirit has me personally sharing this message because God has brought us some, to some a spiritual place or a spiritual plane. God has brought us there. I, I am acutely aware of that. And that means I don't have doubt as to uh, I don't have doubt as to us being there. Um, so we are there. Don't ever choose the temporal over the eternal. Don't do that. So we are in a, in, a, in a beautiful place in the Lord. So Paul is writing here in verse 20 of the first chapter of Romans. He says, for since the creation of the world, uh, his, speaking of God, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So pagans and even unbelieving Jewish people were without excuse. Why? He says, because you cannot look around you and say, uh, there's not a God. 
And, so, and, and not only that, he'll tell us uh, shortly that God has placed in each person a conscience. And so that something, even the pagans, the Gentiles, uh, 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 the Gentiles knew that there was a God. There was some of them knew that there's some, something different here uh, because their conscience is written in our conscience, in our hearts. And so uh, Paul is writing so systematically to the church. Now, I said those things previous because I, I'm saying, I think just like that was a, an idyllic moment, it was the right moment, it was the set moment, a kairos moment in the Greek, a kairos, a set time. I am saying to all of us, it is, there's a set time now, right here by the Spirit of God, that we get some things straight right now and don't comport ourselves as we, many of us, have in a lackadaisical way. Oh, come see, come sir. You know, just kind of doing that, doing what you've always done, acting the way you've always acted, uh, thinking that God gives you a bye because you're cute or handsome. He doesn't do that. So Paul says that these people, uh, uh, because of God, has, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So you, nobody, nobody can just say, as, as my friend Pastor Ken says, he says, I will believe there is no God when you take a handkerchief, throw it up in the air, and it comes down as a fully made T-shirt. And so, uh, so the, uh, the world in which we live is really like a, 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 the result of a world that's always been. And so, Paul, uh, this world that we have right now, I, I, you turn on your television and you hear all kinds of ungodliness, the craziest stuff. The craziest stuff. It's on the news. It's, on, it's in the movies. It's in the plays. It's in the talk shows. It's like, where would, the, where would we go? We go to the rock. We go to Christ Jesus. That's where we go. And, uh, you know, I, you know I am, I, I'd like to think I'm radically saved, but not just a radical. I'm not a nutty guy, a radical guy. But uh, I really, I am very zealous for the Lord. And I'm so zealous, it's very difficult for me. It has been difficult for me for a number of years now to watch a movie. Now, I'm not, it's good television. That one-eyed demon, no, I'm not there. I'm not there. So I'm not that guy. But, but I, it's hard for me to watch television and enjoy programming that, uh, that, that the people are acting in the programming, and I, I just see them going to hell. And I can't enjoy their work, and they're going to hell. I, I, I can't. I mean, I'm just talking to you. And so, and now I used to, then I like sports. I really have enjoyed sports. I thought some of you like sports. I like sports. And then when I hear them interviewing some of these godless guys, I'm not saying all of them are godless. I'm not at all. I'm not saying even all movie actors are godless. But I'm saying they're, 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 it's pervasive there. And I see these, some of these athletes, and I go, wow, man. You know, I don't see any common decency in too many. But then you, ha you always have a few that are, that are godly and are acting right. And so God has them in that place that they might affect that place. And so I am not... Uh, in a blanket way coming against everything that is not my my goal my goal is not even to be balanced here my goal is to be godly here and so the balance comes out of my godliness my godliness doesn't come because i'm balanced i have seen a lot of worldly balance that's imbalanced all right are we good okay if you kind of nod at me sometime i can't see if you wink so you have to nod Okay, so the positions that, that ungodly people hold against God are really indefensible. And we realize, we realize that the last, uh, in the last message. So Paul says it, their positions are indefensible. They are without excuse. You have people who can argue well and uh, they can debate well, but they are still defenseless and without uh, cause in their efforts. Uh, you'll notice how the, there's one ancient debating uh, uh, technique uh, or tactic that if you can't win on the facts, attack the person who's talking. And so that, that's what they do. And this is the world system. And I really have said this for a, a number of years. Those of you who are here, you know that I've said it for a number of years, is that the Lord has been giving us an opportunity to come out from among them and be separate. And I believe, I really believe that this is uh, a clarion call of God to the church. Uh, yes, CCCF, and we're going to amplify that Sunday a bit. So let's look at the Gentile sin. There's a, a 
a statement that you want to never forget. God gave them up. God gave them up. You don't want to forget that. Uh, God gave them up, or that is, he abandoned them to what they insisted on. You know, I, I remember a number of years ago, you know, we had uh, Pastor Joel was preaching one day and here and he said, uh, made a comment. He said, he said, the judgment of God is God finally giving you what you want. And, and that really, it was well said. I mean, we've all said something that perhaps meant that, but that was so succinct that I, I, cap, I captured it as my own. And the Holy Spirit won't let me tell you like it was mine. You know, so, <laughs> so you know how we preachers are, we people of God, we just start telling people stuff and, and uh, you, know, you know, God told me, God, yeah, I think I heard somebody say that a lot of times. Yeah, so, so let's look at, so look at God gave them up, verse 21, because although they knew God, why did God give them up? Because although they knew God, why did God give them up? Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, okay, they didn't glorify him, they weren't thankful, but became, but became futile or empty or worthless in their thoughts and their foolish hearts. Now, why? Because they wouldn't glorify God, because they would not be thankful to God, they would not admit that there was a God, their foolish heart was darkened. And then morality became a real issue, morally senseless, morally senseless. And, uh, and then he says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God, the immortal God. They changed uh, his glory into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So we have seen that. Uh, you can go in and look at some things from antiquity. You can look at, go to museums. And a lot of times, even Greek Christians will go into a museum and we just marvel at, at the, the, the things that men made in worship. That's the nuttiest thing, isn't it? And that shows you the depravity of man. That, and, and we know somebody like that somewhere in our, our life. We, we bumped into somebody like that, that uh, people were worshiping. And they were, uh, many of our ancestors, and it's not just the, the ancestors, my ancestors, but yours too. You know, I mean, all of us, all of us, our ancestors, you know, uh, you know drinking blood out of the skulls of their enemies. You know, making figurines and, and worshiping them. And that just shows you the depravity of man. And, uh, and the scripture says they made these things. They made these things and called them their gods. He said, therefore, or for that cause or that reason, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. And so what God did was he just basically said, come on, okay? You, you insist on that? I'm just going to let it take you where it takes you. But, but God was still striving with them. But even at that, he did not take the conscience away. But they made their, their, their minds and their, their, their uh, thinking darkened. They, they, uh, they snuffed out the light. And you can snuff out the light by not believing God. That is, there's a light burning there that says there's a God. You go, and you blow it out yourself. And you do that not through natural breath, but through disobedience. That's how you blow out the light, by not yielding your thoughts to God. See, I've given up my thoughts for God's thoughts. But you got people because they, they, uh, they um, seem to think that uh, they equate, it would be the right word, they, they equate, there's, they think there's an equality with godliness and, and worldly success. Uh, some of the, one of the greatest men that ever lived in the world, you know, was John the Baptist. Uh, he, he died at about 30 years old, got his hair cut off. Didn't, didn't dress well. He never saw GQ magazine. <laughs> D didn't know that he shouldn't be wearing some camel hair around his, his, his you know, loin cloth and stuff and old leather belt and getting out in the wilderness eating locusts. Eating locusts, I mean, you know, no bread, no rice, you know. Uh, locusts, wild honey, and screaming out, you know, uh, repent, repent, you know. I mean, yeah, one of the most successful men in the world died young. So but you don't equate godliness with that. You know, all that we have, we should give to the Lord for, for whatever he wants. And uh, that's where God has brought the church. And those who go on with God will, will find out 
these good things of God, they are not natural things. It's not the natural things uh, that are showing forth God in our lives. It's those things that are spiritual. So he says, therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And so when God gave them up, that's what happened. Um, and he said, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator uh, who is blessed forever. Amen. And so we talked the last time about the lie that creatures can exist independent of God. Their creatures can be self-sufficient, self-directing and self-fulfilling. And uh, that's the lie that the enemy told our forefathers, and that's the lie he's telling us. And so we see that lie. But what God is doing, God is, is giving us another good dose of truth so that we will be formidable in the days to come. Amen. Thank you. And because they believe the lie, verse 26 says, for this reason, or therefore, that's what it means. It's for this reason God gave them up abandoned them to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. The women did that. So it was all of our ancestors. There was some of this in all of our ancestors. This is crazy. You know, but that's what happened. But now in our day, you have sometimes you have uh, the world, uh, worldly people saying that we must do this. By the way, I think it's wrong-headed, wrong-hearted, bad for Christians to persecute people because they're doing this. Uh, you know, you, you're now hard on people shouting judgmental things at them, being mean. Well, they don't want to come to you. What, it's, they want to be like you? Absolutely not. Would I want to? No. I mean, if you don't, you don't love me, and I'm supposed to come over there and camp out with you? Absolutely not. And, so, and Christians, many Christians have been wrongly disposed. They want, well, just trust me. No, I can't trust you for what I, for what I see in you. And so as, as believers, we're not to be persecuting people because they fit this bill. You don't persecute them. You don't become a part of the persecutors because they fit this bill. Your job is to love them. God loves sinners. If God didn't love sinners, what would you be? And so, so okay, somebody will probably say, Pastor Don is soft on homosexuality. No, I'm not. I'm soft on Christian, quote, unquote, meanness. <laughs> yeah. Let's look at this thing right. Let's look at this thing right. It's amazing stuff. And so I'm, I'm trying to catch us up. And um, so, so uh, where was I? Okay. So for even that women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, the men. The men did the same thing that was against nature. Likewise, the men. Uh, leaving the natural use of the woman. Burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And there are a lot of people who will say, but Donald Bell is a homophobic man. That is not true. That is totally not true. But I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm a preacher of righteousness. And so if we don't tell the truth and demonstrate the truth, how is the truth going to be known? No, you say, well, are you for diversity, equality, and inclusion? I'm for the gospel. I'm for the truth. That's what I'm for. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's what we all should be for. And we should, we should tell the truth lovingly. Not tell the truth to hurt somebody, you know, to beat somebody down. That's not who we are. So I would like to see a lot of Christian charity in the church. I want to see Christians just loving people. Not being permissive, but loving people, you know. And I, may I just say something? I'm going to kind of divert to something. And I'm going to ask you for about six or seven of your minutes. Um, I, I told Brother uh, Rennie to give me X number of minutes. And... And then he looked at me and smiled, and I said, but, you know, that's, that's sort of a guardrail for me. You know, I may run off into this, away out of the guardrail. But anyway, anyway, so, so let me just say, uh, I kind of almost lost, maybe I lost my thought for a moment. But, but I, I wanted to say something like this, that, yes, thank you, Holy Spirit. I, I am glad that I grew up like I grew up. You may think that's nutty. I'm glad I grew up with pressure. I'm glad I grew up being mistreated just because I've got black skin. I'm, gl I'm glad. No, I'm not playing games with you. I'm glad I went through it all because at this juncture, I look and I say, wow, man. Thank you, Jesus, for everything I've suffered because I can put myself in the place of suffering people. I, I can. I, and I, and I mean, I'm 
it's been a long while since I've shuffled a lot of things. But sometimes when I go places, and, you know, travel around the world or even here in America, and, and you know, Pastor Don, you know, the, the, really seriously, the, the head or general overseer, really, of, of the Fellowship International, because I don't take that title, I haven't taken it thus far. But, uh, you know, that, and, and I go with the team, and, and, uh, and uh, somebody says, this is Pastor Don, blah, 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 and they look at everybody on my team but me. I still suffer those indignities. They, they, they look at my team members. They'll ask my team members things. They won't even ask me. And so sometimes I'll say, Ex excuse me, I think you need to look at me when you're talking, please. Sometimes I have to do that even now. But I'm grateful to God because I can put myself in the place of hurting people. And those of us who cannot put ourselves in the, in the uh, place of hurting people or suffering indignities, then we just be, need to be nice and sweet. <laughs> That's what God wants from the church. And, and so th this, this is how we change things. We don't change things by our rhetoric. We change things by, by our righteousness. Yeah. And so here in Romans, he's relitigating Romans 1. Yes, I am. <laughs> Likewise, the men, this is what he said, by, by the men, uh, leaving the natural use of a woman. The, the word really uh, means divorcing uh, that. It was like cut it off, man, or uh, disregarding, it, giving it up, abandoning it, leaving in order to go to another place, leaving what is right in order to go to a place that's wrong. That's how deceitful sin is, all right? But we still good? Dog, almost too quiet for me. Um, and so he says, verse 28, and even as they did not like, now this, this is mind-blowing, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge because it's too convicting to have God in my knowledge while I'm doing other stuff. So if I can just forget God, I can do my own thing. This is amazing. It says, and what, did, what did God do? God gave them over to a debased mind, a disapproved mind, to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, there's unrighteousness, covetousness, maliciousness. Now, I want to show you that with the homosexuality, the men with men, the women with women, he's saying all these other things too. Now, now it's very seldom that in the day in which we live that we talk about these other things. We always want to talk about the homosexuals, but there are a lot of heterosexual stuff here that we are, we're leaving out. I'm not saying, okay, let's be fair and balanced. I'm just saying, let's preach the truth. And just be open to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit might tell us what to say, when to say, how to say. That's what, uh, this is a challenge to the church of Jesus Christ. And I know that I know that I know that God has raised me up, kept me alive, disciplined me, took, picked me over his knee many times, and gave me some real blisters to say, I want you to stand and tell the truth. I know that. And I know he's raised you up for the same. I know he's raised you up for the same. And so we're not going to take, get our talking points from the world, from uh, our favorite television station. Uh, uh, I almost made a joke there, but I, I thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> but our, our, favorite, our favorite television station, we get our talking points from the B-I-B-L-E. That's where you get your talking points from the Bible. You get your talking points from the Bible. And so you need to pick up your Bible and read that Bible. And that's where we get our talking points from. And so we don't find out, well, what's, what are they doing out there? What's being said? Let me go to Facebook. No, you can go to Facebook to put what you heard from the Bible. But don't go there to get what, what you think the Bible is saying. Are oh, you still with me? Okay. Okay. Okay, I think I've got now five minutes left. All right? <laughs> five. Okay, so, so these things, uh, people were, uh, they did all these things that are not fitting. Uh, filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, and not just homosexual immorality, but sexual immorality, all right? I mean, heterosexual, you know, predator, predators, predatory men, and even some predatory women. Yeah, predatory men, okay? And there's some, okay, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, uh, envy, full of envy, says. Murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, Gossipers, yeah, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. 
disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, they not only do the same but also approve of those who practice them. So the devil has so deceived people that they are partying and living depraved lives, thinking they're having fun, but they are on their way to hell, eternal, eternal punishment, and they don't know it. What a deception. In Romans chapter 2, now, he says, so that means you're not going to have to listen to Romans 1 again from me for a long, long time. <laughs> so Romans 2, 1 says, uh, this is the third time in this segment that he uses uh, the word we translate, therefore. Okay, he says, therefore, for this reason, for this cause, you are inexcusable, O oh man, whoever you are. Doesn't matter if you're the deacon, you're the pastor, you're the apostle, doesn't matter who you are. You are inexcusable, O oh man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. For, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth. So every judgment that you make, according to God, it will be truth against those who practice such things. Uh, so the, the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? So what, what Paul is doing is removing hypocrisy from the church, and we've talked about that, that there would be a great move of God. It would be called the desecularization of the church. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that's where we are. Oh, wow. I almost got Pentecostal right there for a moment. But seriously, I almost did. I almost did one of those, you know, man. I mean, uh, don't say it. Half of the folks are running. All right, let's go back to it. It says, um, and do you, th okay, God's judgment is according to truth. Man's judgment comes from condemnation. God's judgment comes from himself, the truth. And so but God's judgment sees all sides. Man's judgment just sees what it sees. Yeah, but God's judgment sees every side. So what the Lord wants to do and is doing, is doing, not just wants to, is doing. He's bringing us together. He's going to bring people that we th never thought would come. There are last many people who are coming. And he's going to, he's bringing those people who we never thought would come. And some of them are going to be more diligent than some of us. Because we've been just at ease in the house of God. Come on, guys, you don't have to be. You know, uh, somebody said, well, Pastor, just too, uh, they said this way years ago. They said, oh, he's just too competitive, too competitive. Well, it's just that, I mean, I don't consider myself competitive. It's just that I want to be the best for God. Amen. You know, I remember in the Army, I wasn't the best athlete in my school. I wasn't the best athlete. I was an okay athlete, you know, because Dad didn't believe in that kind of stuff. He thought it was just taking us from God. And so I wasn't the best athlete. We were pretty good. But I was in the military. I, I, I didn't want to be last. And so I, I, I was really, really good in my company. I won't tell you the number, number I, uh, I, I was when we finished with all of our PT and, and evaluation, but I sure I wasn't fourth. <laughs> so, so, so yes, verse four. Or do you despise, listen, this is what you have to do. Because sometimes people are messed up and they just don't know it and they won't let anybody tell them. They're messed up. They don't know it, but they don't want you to tell them. They'll fight you. Now listen. Or do you despise, number one, the riches of his goodness, forbearance, long-suffering? You despise that? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Do you, respi do, do you despise his goodness? It's his goodness that's leading you to himself. And God just allows you and allows you. He's not some God who's trying to placate you, pacify you. But God is saying, no, I, I love you, baby. It's like a parent with a, 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 a petulant child or, or a naughty teenager and you keep just trying to talk to them and, and be generous to them and they act like, well, daddy, daddy, daddy must be scared of me. I'm the cock of the walk. <laughs> you know, no. No, it's, it's goodness. Because then because when daddy come down, yeah, I'm a dad. I'm a dad. I remember saying to somebody, one of my children, you know, uh, uh, concerning one of my children, I said to my wife, I said, I want you to be this child's mother, but I'm going to be your daddy. And so, Daddy, God is like that. When judgment comes to the house of God, it's not like you're going to hell. 
Not if you're his. But he may take you home. And your work's cut off. I don't want my work to be cut off prematurely. I don't want that to happen. I don't want it to happen to you. So Paul is talking to the church in Rome like this, like I'm talking to you. He says here in verse 5, and I'm, I'm coming to this around the band there. But in, in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. He's not saying you're saved by works here, not at all. He said, eternal life to those who, by patient continuance in doing good, seek for, this is what we have to do, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, this is what they're going to get. Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also for the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So what Paul is talking about, an amazing reality, a truth of God, a truth of God that cannot be negated. This is what he is saying, and this is what we have been saying all along. We have come to the kingdom now for a time such as this. All of those things that we were talking about decades ago, we have come to them. Those things that were prophesied in this house have come to us and upon us. This is what God is saying. And I, I feel like this is now the semester exam. I used to say to my, our children, I would say to them, I don't do well all semester and flunk the semester exam. Don't flunk the semester exam. And that's what I'm saying to the church now. This is what I believe Paul is saying to the Romans. And uh, I know God is speaking this to us. So I bless you. And really, seriously, forgive me for taking a little bit more of your time. But I didn't want to stop it in the middle where it didn't all come together. That's why I did that. We love you. And Sister Steph, please.